you, Dr. Frankel, for being here with us today. You know, your, your work was just truly life-changing for me. And I don't know what caught my attention when I saw your book and, and maybe it was the, the phrase, nice girls, <laughs> right? And, uh, and that's who you help are, are people who are just trying to be nice, nice girls, nice guys. Um, would you mind sharing, you know, what motivates you to do this work and write these books and, and who you are? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. What motivates me to write the books, especially Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office, is wanting to provide women who may never have an executive coach. I mean, let's face it, most women will not have an executive coach. And I wanted to provide them with the exact same coaching that I was giving to my clients. I thought, you know, I, I don't need to hoard this. I can just like tell you exactly what I tell my clients. And so um, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office was actually born in a client's office when um, she, she was a vice president of manufacturing uh, at a, a East Coast company. And I had um, flown there, I live in Los Angeles and I had flown there for a coaching session. And she said, before we get started, I just wanna let you know, I was invited to sit on the executive committee in my company and I went to give her a high five and she stopped me. And I said, what? And she said, I'm not going to do it. And I said, this better be good. Mm. And she said, you know, I've been to those meetings and they're a waste of time. And what popped out of my mouth was, honey, you got to quit being a girl. And at that moment, all the mistakes I've seen women make because of how they're socialized came through my head and all of nice girls don't get the corner office was actually um, outlined on the plane back from Herndon, Virginia to Los Angeles that night, because it just became so clear to me in that moment that our socialization causes us to do things that are not in our best interest. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, we're, we're it's kind of a guilt and shame based society, Right. And, and it's all about sacrificing yourself for others. And if you don't sacrifice yourself, right, like you're looked as like, well, you're just being selfish and well, we're all inherently selfish. Right. Well, we all have to have some healthy uh, egocentrism. You know, if we don't have that, then we're just doormats. Uh, we'll never get our needs met. So we all need to have some healthy selfishness. Yeah. A friend of mine just wrote a book. Uh, she was gonna. She was gonna call it the healthy narcissists, um, and she she thought better of it. But but it is about how can you take better care of yourself. Yeah, can you explain to us? You know, how do you how would you know someone's like a nice girl or a nice guy? Like like what what type of person is this who's like maybe overly nice and and what's like going on on the back end? Right, they're trying to get their needs met. Right. So who would you describe as someone who's who's nice? Well, I would say, think of someone like Sally Field or Vanna White, right? I mean, when you think about somebody like Vanna White, I mean, there is the quintessential nice girl, right? Just turning those letters on that TV show. Um, and yeah. so when I think about, you know, what are the components of someone who is overly nice? It's someone who takes better care of everyone else than they take care of themselves. Yeah. that they are so so consumed with the disease to please that they don't get their needs taken care of. That, as you said, they feel as if it's selfish to ask for what they want. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what I see as being part of this whole nice girl syndrome. Um, in the book, I describe it as a, a nice girl is one who acts according to the rules she was taught in childhood, was appropriate for a little girl, right? I mean, that's why it's called nice girls don't get the corner office, not nice women don't. Nice women do get the corner office. Nice girls don't get the corner office. And so, um, you know, it's it's that whole thing about uh, be kind and be sweet and, you know, uh, don't, be over, don't be overbearing. And, you know, all these messages that girls get either explicitly or implicitly, and they still get them. Uh, you know, I was talking to some little girls on my street the other day and, and I was asking about the messages that they got and they were, they were like eight and nine years old. They were, they were saying, you know, like, well, like, you know, on um, social media, we're supposed to be this and we're supposed to be that. And that's not realistic. They knew at this little, at this age that it wasn't realistic. Wow. That's just like, mm -hmm. you know, a, a term or a phrase I often hear is like, I don't want to rock the boat. 
you know, there's like a fear right. of conflict, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's one a big problem for women um, is not approaching conflict because life is going to have conflict. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it has to demolish you or the other person. And that's so much of what I try to teach people is how do you have your own voice and have high respect for other people too? For me, that's the essence of being assertive is, is not just about focusing on my needs, but about focusing on our needs. And, and what do I need to do to get my needs met? And in the process, how can I help you do the same? And for me, I think that plays well to women's strengths if they give themselves permission to think that they deserve more than they have. Exactly. I, I love you brought up that word permission. You know, what I find is with, with a lot of my re- recovering people pleasers is what I call them, <laughs> recovering people, mm-hmm. pleasing, including myself, is like there's often like I need to wait for someone else to tell me and give me permission to put my needs first to, to go, to go work out or to go do something for myself, take that bath or take that vacation or to just, to just make themselves happy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Like we're always waiting for permission. Guys don't wait for permission, right? You know, they don't ask for permission. They ask for forgiveness. They just do what they want. If somebody doesn't like it, they say, well, you know, I'm sorry. You didn't like that, but um, that's the way I thought it needed to be done, or that's what I wanted to do or, or whatever. And, and I think we need to stop asking permission, period, period. Yeah. We expect children to ask permission. We don't expect adults to ask permission. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is like, what it comes down to is now we're kind of, you know, reparenting ourselves. We're, we're becoming our own parent now and we're giving ourselves permission to put our needs first. And, and because what, what, I mean, what would you say are the consequences of being nice? You know, what are the consequences? Yeah. Well, you know, nice is necessary for success. It's simply not sufficient. Okay. If you are only nice and you don't have a voice of your own, you will never achieve your goals. You will be taken advantage of people will marginalize you because they won't see you as somebody to be taken seriously or to be promoted or to get the things that you want. So if you are only nice or you focus exclusively on being nice, not rocking the boat, making sure everybody's okay. If you you do that exclusively, people may like you, but you're not gonna get your needs met. And they probably aren't gonna take you seriously. You're not gonna be a contender. Um, Because really when you think about it, you know, what did I, I just watched, uh, oh, it was that whistleblower from um, Facebook and she was on 60 Minutes the other night. And she was, she communicated so clearly, so professionally. Um, I, you know, I said to myself, you know, this is a woman who I believe and I take seriously. Mm-hmm. And I think women need to get comfortable with that with um, not needing to make sure everything, everybody's okay with what you're saying, but rather that you are speaking your truth um, in a healthy way that, like I said, it doesn't demolish other people. It never has to. Yeah, you know, often I hear constantly with with recovering people pleasers, whether it's a girl or guy is like, well, I fear disappointing someone else. Yeah, and isn't that true? that's a woman thing isn't it you know I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint somebody if I don't do this or you know I feel guilty you know and and I talk about that in in one of my books about feeling guilty guilt serves no purpose in our lives there's there's guilt serves zero purpose and you have to yeah you have to really exercise that from your life because it doesn't serve a purpose um and really replace that with saying, I have certain rights and needs and wants and expectations, and I know other people do too. And I'm not saying mine supersede anybody else's. I just want to make sure mine get um, considered in the equation as well. That's all. It's like, you know, in a, it, it, my most recent book, which was the audio book, Nice Girls Don't Speak Up and Stand Out. You know, originally I was calling that how to tell people to go to hell so they look forward to the trip. 
because that's really what women have to do. They have, they have to be able to tell people to really take a hike um, in such a way that the person's gonna look forward to going. And, and that takes some skill and finesse, uh, but it can be done. It absolutely can be done. Yeah. And, that, and that's what that book is all about. It tells you how to do it. Yeah. You know, what I loved about, um, nice girls just don't get it was, and why I specifically really loved your book is because you gave like, here's probably what you have been doing. <laughs> here's unhealthy, yep. here's toxic. And you know, here, here's what's like, here's how, here's what you can say to get your needs met. Here's what you can, here's what's healthy because a lot of this audience, they don't even have a role model for that. No. Yeah. And, and, and that is part of the problem, isn't it? You know, I just, yeah. I just started uh, writing a book on how to raise a self-confident daughter because a, a couple of people have asked me for those books and I couldn't find one. And I talked to you know friends and neighbors who have little girls and I said, is there a book that you would recommend? Nobody knew of one. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm gonna write one. And that's the first thing that I talk about in the book. If you wanna raise a self-confident daughter, you have to exhibit self-confidence. And, and again, self-confidence is, don't confuse it with um, narcissism, with unhealthy narcissism, yeah. because it's not the same thing. Self-confidence is, is simply that ability to say, I may not have done this before, I may not know how to do this, but I'm smart enough to figure it out. You know, that's self-confidence, knowing that I can handle myself in almost any situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you talk a lot in your book about communication and what I find is a lot with people who are struggling to get their needs met, especially nice girls or even nice guys is that there's a lot of underlying resentment and there, you, you talk about this martyrdom and there's like this, I'm, I'm sacrificing myself for you, or there's this game that's played and it's a game I know I, I've played in the past and I kept trying to catch myself is like, look how hard I tried. I've done this for you. I've done this for you. And there's this needing to earn, there's this needing to earn attention and earn a love and earn approval. And it's just this, this like, I mean, clients come into my office just exhausted. And I'm sure they come to you exhausted from this vicious cycle of trying to earn and do. And, and what I like to tell these people is like, well, you're not a human doing you're a human being. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what would it be like? Can, can you talk a little bit about this, this urge for approval and where, where it might like where it stems from? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it's been said that if you didn't hear it from your mother and father, you'll never hear it. So if you didn't hear, I'm proud of you. Um, you know, you're really smart. You're so capable. Uh, you're a good person, whatever it is. If you didn't hear that, then it's gonna be really hard for you to say it to yourself. And I think that's that part, I know before we started taping, we were talking about reparenting ourselves. And I think there is a degree of that that has to, has to go on where you need to move from being this nice little girl that you were taught to be in childhood to being this adult woman or adult man, in some cases, if you're one of these nice guys, overly nice guys, um, you need to be able to make that transition. And, and as I said, nice is necessary for success, but it's not sufficient. And so I don't tell people to be less nice. Hey, look, if nice is one of your greatest attributes, um, I would never say stop being nice. What I would say is, okay, now what do you need to add to the equation that would balance it out? One of the ways that I talk about it, I compare it to like a, a prize fighter. You can have a prize fighter that has a great left jab, but they have no right uppercut. They're not gonna win many bouts, right? So that nice, being nice may be the left jab, but you need to add the right uppercut. And that might be things like um, knowing how to approach conflict. Okay, in um, Nice Girls uh, Don't Speak Up or Stand Out, I talk about a model for how to have a difficult conversation. And there's other books out on this, um, but, but I just happen to have one model that I like to use that says, you know, here's how you're gonna have a difficult conversation. And 
if you prepare for it, it's more likely to go smoothly in the way that you want. Mm -hmm. And so it, the model is called the DESC script, D-E-S-C. And so I describe what I wanna to talk to you about. I explain how I see things. I elicit from you how you see things. I specify what I'd like to have happen and I provide consequences. And most of the time those consequences should be positive. And so if I follow that script, a difficult conversation doesn't have to go south and it doesn't have to feel mean. And I think that's what, you know, most women are really afraid they're gonna get called a bitch, right? When it yeah. comes right down to it, it's like as if that's the worst thing someone should call me. <laughs> and what I say to people is usually when you get called a bitch, it, 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 and believe me, I know that there are some women who, out there who are, who are bitches and there's guys who are bastards too. Um, pardon all my language, but it's the shorthand for what I'm trying to say. Um, but there's worse things to be called, right? And usually when you get called that, it's because you've taken care of yourself and not someone else. Exactly, yeah. And so, so that's what you wanna say to yourself is that when I get called those names, it's usually because I've done something right, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that you brought this up because I hear this often. There's this, well, if I start saying no, if I start like saying, you know, that's not for me, like that's terrifying. And then, you know, from women, I do hear this word, well, I'm going to be a bitch or I'm going to be called selfish and, and all of these things that, um, that create this feeling inside of us. And, and it's exactly like you said, it's just like, wow, now you're, you're, you're either probably communicating with someone who doesn't want you to start putting your needs first because they were benefiting from you. Not exactly. First. And, uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, who doesn't like nice little girls? They write songs about little girls, right? Maurice Chevalier, thank heaven for little girls, right? It's like, who doesn't like a nice little girl? Um, <laughs> they're always pleasant. <laughs> they're always yeah, pleasant, right. right? They never ask for anything. They, and so part of that, you know, in our socialization, and we don't see it as much on TV anymore. You know, like I know I grew up with Leave it to Beaver's mother, who was like, you know, who really was a doormat when you think about it. Um, but, and I know you don't see that as much anymore. But there is still a thread that runs through society that um, suggests that women should care more about helping others than about taking care of themselves. And I believe in taking care of others. I absolutely do. But I don't think taking care of me and taking care of others is mutually exclusive. That, you know, uh, that if I'm doing both, we all benefit. Yeah. If I do only one, if I only take care of myself, you're not going to benefit. Mm -hmm. If I only take care of you, I'm not going to benefit. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to wear out. My, my uh, well will become dry. And yeah. so, so much of what I talk about my books are how do, you, how do you do that? Like when you just said saying no, one of the things uh, I talk about in the audio book is that I suggest that you never say no, right? You, if you're afraid of saying no, don't say no. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe in meeting every request with yes, I'm happy to do that. And let me tell you what it'll take. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. And, yeah. And so if I start every request with, yeah, if I answer every request, I mean, provided it's not illegal or uh, immoral or unethical, you know, yes, I'd be happy to do that for you. At the same time, here's what I, I'll need in order to do it. Love okay, it. or how much time I'll need or realistically that's not enough time and I'm happy to do it I just will need more time to do it so so again it's about thinking about what do you need in response to yes yeah what I'm hearing is like negotiating skills yeah you know it is actually negotiating in some ways isn't it yeah and and that's another thing women have a hard time with uh, they tend to see negotiation as confrontation that it's about a win-lose and nothing could be further from the truth for women because women can't negotiate like men when women negotiate like men they do they are called bitches and they are seen as difficult and so we need to negotiate from a place of relationships yeah. right 
where, you know, I want to maintain this relationship. And there's nothing more important to me than doing that. And at the same time, let me tell you what I'll need to do that. You know, yeah. as a matter of fact, I was just working with a woman this weekend who got a job offer and she was happy with the job offer, but it wasn't everything she wanted. And she said, you know, I'm afraid if I go back and I say, well, this is what I want now. They'll take back the job offer. Well, I know we were fearful of that, but it rarely happens. And I said, okay, you know, if you're going to go back and negotiate, then you need to go back and negotiate from a place of a strong relationship, which is, I am thrilled to get this job offer. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to working with you folks. And at the same time, there's just a few things that I'll need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Hey, look, how hard is that? You know, I, I, I know it's hard. I know it's hard for women to do if they've never done it before. But again, if you think about coming from a place of the relationship is important, but so are my needs. Yeah. It, everything shifts. You know what? I don't know where I read this, but it was talking more about, it's like, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the system as a whole working together. Mm-hmm. And if you just focus on just that person, like, let's say you, you were to just be a pleaser and you were just going to please. Well, the system's already breaking down now. Or if you were to just focus on you and you made it all about you, which is more, more narcissistic tendencies, right? Now the system's going to break down, but it's just more about like, well, how do we stay together? How do we make this relationship work? Because in order for that to happen, I have to also be taken care of. And as well as you taking care of yourself. And it's, you know, what I find is it's it's just about relinquishing that control of of the outcome that they specifically want and just allowing right? Mm-hmm. To just for like the things to unfold as the way they are. I know that was a struggle with me was to just relinquish control of everything and everyone around me. Right. <laughs> I know. And have you, have you done relinquished it? Yeah. And and isn't and it, it liberating? It's so freeing when, when you can be okay with people making decisions that's best for themselves because it's like isn't that what you want to don't you Mm want to also like I like to flip it around like okay well now as you're allowing them to do what they think is best for them isn't that what you want to do you want Mm -hmm. somebody controlling you and trying to be inside your head all all the time (laughs) Mm -hmm. well you know the fact is that we can't control anyone except ourselves it's an illusion yeah, I, it's an illusion to think I control anyone. Um, and so when I control myself, and we, I don't even like the word control myself. I guess when I have a, a deep understanding of myself and my needs um, and act with the best of intentions, mm-hmm. then I'm going to get what I need. Now, something you said, it's interesting because something you said reminds me of the quid pro quo, you know, when you talked about um there's got to be something in it for everyone. Well, inherent to every relationship, there's a quid pro quo. There's something in exchange for something else. Every relationship. I don't care what the relationship is. And it's when that quid pro quo goes south that you see relationships falter. When people don't recognize that I need to be giving as much as I'm getting because that's the way the world works. I mean, if we look at Washington today, and I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, but if you look at Washington, the quid pro quo has faltered. And so we can't get anything done. You know, in days past, uh, people understood that quid pro quo. Some people called it, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I don't care what you called it, Um, but it was a quid pro quo and it's inherent to every relationship. And so you need to make sure that you're not just always giving, to the quid pro quo and not getting. Yeah, it's kind of makes sense. sense. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of that metaphor of like trying to pour from an empty cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, if nothing's there, like if you're tired, if you're exhausted, if you're not taking care of yourself, how in the world are, do you expect to teach a child 
how to, how to put themselves first. Like the child is, is paying attention, right. To how you make decisions and, and your reactions to things. That's what they're going to learn. Right. And going back to what you're talking about, like raising a nice girl, um, mm-hmm. and maybe, you know, a nice girl as a child heard things like what, what, what have a, a nice girl heard, heard as a child? I know one thing I can think of is like, Oh, make sure you're nice for the babysitter or make sure you're <laughs> nice for, for your friends, your friends, parents, you know, your grandparents are coming, make sure you're nice. Now, did you have any brothers? I had a, I have a brother. Yeah. Did your brother get that message about nice? No. <laughs> no. Right, yeah. I have two brothers and they didn't get the nice message somehow. They didn't get that memo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I know we, we kind of have to wrap things up here and this is something I'm sure us both could talk about all day, but um, just to wrap things up, Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to a nice girl, you know, let's say who's a woman now who's struggling with, who's exhausted, who's, who's not taking care of her health because she feels like she has to sacrifice herself and her needs for others. What, um, what piece of advice might, might you give her to just kind of, kind of get things going for her? Yeah, I think the piece of advice I would give would be to say, no one will ever take as good care of you as you will take care of yourself. Yeah. So give up that illusion that you'll be taken care of. You know, it's like one of my friends says, a man is not a financial plan. Um, And so you need to take care of yourself in all ways. And I don't mean just healthy, health wise. Financially, are you involved in your finances at home? If you're not, you're not taking care of yourself. I can't tell you how many women weren't involved uh, only to find that their husbands had squirreled away money. And when they got divorced, they were left with nothing. So um, professionally at work, don't wait to be given what you want, ask for it. I'm not saying be a squeaky wheel. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying have an idea of what you want that you don't currently have and develop a plan to get it because no one will take better care of you than you will take care of yourself. Yeah. And, and nobody knows your, your needs like you do too. Right. So, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times women don't know what their needs are. Yeah. Um, and this is real. I'm sure you see this too. Uh, and this is really troublesome. Because when I talk to women and they say, well, you know, I don't know what I want. I just know I don't want what I have. Exactly. Well, how can you not know what you want, right? How can you not know what you want? Uh, So that all has to be excavated. Exactly. Yes. And I love that word excavated, like kind of diving in and seeing what feels good and what doesn't, right? And this is where we start working on boundaries, right? And I know your book goes into a lot of... um, you know, establishing boundaries, but a a lot of that really comes down to, you know, communication and doing that communication Mm -hmm. in a nonviolent, in a very effective way that, that keeps, um, I'm not going to say maintain the peace because it may not maintain the peace, right? It it may Mm -hmm. very well rock the boat, but at the same time, like, what I have found in my own experience is that the people, you know, the, when, when I have to circle back and say, Hey, you know, I, I didn't feel good about that or have that conversation. These people, you know, we, we tend to catastrophize these yeah. opportunities. And I find that these people actually stick around and, and they come around and they kind of bounce it around inside themselves for a while. And, you know, everything I think is going to happen actually never really does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love that word catastrophize. And we do tend to catastrophize things. And you know, I know one of my favorite sayings is, it'll everything's going to be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, it's not the end. I love it. Oh, yep. beautiful. I just got like, <laughs> I just got <laughs> filled up from, from that phrase. So thank you, Lois, so much for your insights. I know you've already helped so many people. And this, this just this short time with you, I think is going to start churning um, some gears for people. So um, Lois, can you tell us where they can go to find out more about you? And I know you have a, a workbook, a companion book to what yeah. you've already put out there. Yeah. Uh, you can learn more about me on my website, which is drloisfrankel.com. That's D-R-L-O-I-S-F-R-A-N-K-E-L.com. And there are free uh, resources on the site. You could take self-inventories about if you're a nice girl, what are the particular areas you need to work on? 
Um, nice girls don't get rich. What are the financial areas you need to work on and so forth? So there's free resources on there. And then I'll be ha happy to send anybody who contacts me at info at drlawisfrankel.com. That's info at drlawisfrankel.com. Um, a workbook that goes along with nice girls don't speak up and stand out. And the workbook actually can stand by itself and has all these models for how to communicate uh, with courage and confidence. It's got the desk script model, it's got the headline model, how to influence other people. So it, it, it's actually a standalone by itself, but it's designed to go along with you hearing me say, how do you do these things and what do they sound like? Oh, I love it. I, I'm so I'm so excited for, for people to hear this. And this is such an important resource for so many people. Again, I feel like you talked about shame. You talked about guilt, how these things have really no place in our lives today. And mm -hmm. this is actually something you can actually learn to get rid of and replace with something else that whether it's like self-respect or compassion or self-love, call it whatever you want. But um, yeah, please go check out um, Lois's website. Again, email her at uh, info at drloisfrankel.com for more information or for that workbook. And uh, Lois, thank you so much for, for your time today. And I, I'm, I'm just so excited to, to keep up this relationship and continue um, to spread the word. <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to be with you.